Hi, good afternoon everyone. Can we wait for five more minutes for more people to come in? Yeah, thank you.
Hello? Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay. Okay. So, yeah. Shall we start? Okay. Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming and joining us in this session. In this hall, DJ Danarash Auditorium, as well as in YouTube. Okay, we are having YouTube live of the session right now. My name is Chin Hai. I'm from the UM eHealth Unit, Faculty of Medicine. UM and I will be the chair for this session. First and foremost, I just would like to thank our speakers, Associate Professor Amiruddin Kamsing from the Faculty of Computer Science and IT, UM. Okay. Mr. Andrew, Mr. Daniel Andrew and the team, Mr. Kevin, Mr. Aditya for flying from Indonesia just to share with everyone about this metaverse, MR, VR, and AR. And especially to Ms. Shida, Shida, uh, the Education Lead for Microsoft Malaysia. Thanks for coming again today, making time for this session. Okay? Does it work? Okay. So, the session this afternoon is entitled Virtual Reality and Mixed Reality in Healthcare. I believe all of you might have heard about the term VR, AR, MR, but this afternoon, the speaker is going to share with you a newer term, sort of, called Metaverse, okay? which is commonly referred to the next phase of the internet nowadays. Okay, VR, AR, MR, and Metaverse, I'm sure you guys have known about this, is very useful for many purposes, including education, work, entertainment, even shopping, and even healthcare. Okay, I'm sure you have heard about them quite a while, but how come we haven't seen them or feel them in our daily routine, just like how mobile phone is dominating our life. Where is VR, AR right now? Okay, so this again brings back the theme of the research carnival. Okay, where we need all the stakeholders, the four, the four big jigsaw puzzle you see on the top, academic, community, industry, innovator, to be aware about the potential of all this and work together to bring the idea of metaverse into realization. Okay, so not going to talk too much. There will be two talks uh, this, uh, this afternoon. First by Prof. Amir and then by the Microsoft HoloLens team. We will have Q&A session after each talk. And then the HoloLens team will also do a demo for all you. And if you are keen to try out the HoloLens, feel free to raise your hand later when they are calling you up. Okay? If you don't have enough time to try it out here, feel free to go to our booth in Center Point anytime later or tomorrow until Friday, okay? For the online participants, if you have questions, feel free to post them along the way, okay? So I think we'll just start with the first talk. The first talk is entitled, A Review on Metaverse in Education and Healthcare by Professor Amiruddin Kamsing. Just a quick introduction about Prof. Amir. Prof. Amir is a lecturer from our Faculty of Computer Science and IT. He's also the acting director of UM Professional Development and Leadership Center. Also the deputy director of UM Center for Continuing Education. Okay, he received his degree in UM, master in the computer animation in Bournemouth University, PhD from the UCL, UC College London. And his research area include human-computer interaction, authentication system, e-learning, mobile applications, serious game, and obviously the topic today, AR, VR, MR, okay? Without further ado, let me welcome, let us welcome Prof. Amir. Okay. Hello. You can see. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Good afternoon. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Faculty of Medicine and my friends uh, for 
uh, inviting me and um, and my student actually couldn't come, uh, Madam Bimel, uh, to present sort of an overview of metaverse uh, in education, particularly in medicine and uh, healthcare. So uh, before uh, receiving this invitation, I a bit uh, reluctant to talk to about this because to us is also a new thing. So I hope that can you can uh, accept the limitations if I have. Um, so it's just a matter of sharing what we have reviewed so far because uh, my uh, student, uh, Bimel, is doing uh, metaverse in education, particularly in STEM subjects, something like that. So I think it's a very good opportunity if we have a re overview of uh, metaverse in education uh, in healthcare as well. So I hope that this is a uh, the beginning for faculty of medicine and other members to work on these uh, very potential areas. Although it's new, it's uh, very good to explore. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chin, also for introducing about myself. So, um, so during my talk, so basically, um, okay, sorry, all right, sorry. So basically, there are. Uh, few things uh, that I would like to talk about today. Um, first is about the overview of Metaverse. And secondly, I'm going to talk about our Metaverse methods, uh, which have been used uh, in medicine. And the third one is uh, regarding Metaverse in medical education, where I like to share about the uh, review on advantages, limitation, challenges, issue, and so on, particularly in uh, with regards to medical education and training. And last but not least, uh, conclusion. Okay, so uh, I think as I talked to uh, my friend, uh, Metaverse is something, a concept that some to some is new, to some is uh, something very, uh, you know, can be perceived as something that has been talked about frequently and something that maybe people have different perceptions or understanding of what Metaverse is. So based on our um, findings, uh, Metaverse can be defined as a virtual shared space where everyone can access. So uh, it's sort of a conversion of physical, augmented and virtual reality in a shared online space. And basically when we talk about this, so basically it includes uh, an integration and overlaps of what we call digital world um, where most of us have been uh, come across with uh, terminologies such as Internet of Things, IoT, AR, VR, cloud computing, age computing, blockchain, AI and other technology. So uh, this um, in this context basically um, with this digital identity so it involves three components what we call uh, humans uh, machines and materials. So uh, if we look at metaverse, so there are many uh, branches or opportunities that make use of this metaverse. Apart from healthcare, so we also um, have seen in terms of entertainment, uh, military, manufacturing, education. So uh, just to share that, the one that we have just started is about uh, metaverse in education. So this is some things that we are also exploring the potential of metaverse to be used in education. So if we uh, look at metaverse itself, it can be uh, categorized into uh, four uh, categories. So first of all, uh, we define it as virtual worlds. So it's an alternative realities where there are social and economic interactions which occur among multiple users. Um, secondly, it's a mirror world. So it's something that are based on data, uh, rich informational enhanced virtual models where the model develop based on the real data. So we come up with the virtual model of structures, building and stuff like that. Or even we can have annotation tools to enrich the understanding of the structures, building and so on. Or even the in context of medical organ and stuff like that. AR, some things that has been uh, with us for some uh, quite time. So um, our technologies that enhance the external physical world for individuals, um, where the virtual image uh, overlay with the virtual physical real world. So you can see, like, for example, you can have uh, with the devices and stuff like that. So you can have like a virtual 
uh, humans uh, right in front of you, so something like that. And last but not least, the fourth category is uh, live logging, which is a process to record capture and store everyday experiences and life history of people and objects. Okay, um, so this is just to um, divide those uh, the concept into four categories and internally you see that there's uh, applications but I'm not going to talk about that but what uh, we can associate uh, available technologies or application with different categories or map with different categories or metaverse okay um, so the second things that I would like to share is about the metaverse in medicine so we would like to see how the metaverse is used in medicine so as I mentioned earlier so um, it's quite um, important for uh, us to understand about what we call digital twin so maybe some of you have come across it even have master about what digital twin is basically it's a uh, technology which enables uh, us to generate a virtual twin of hospital uh, which give us opportunity for us to review our operational strategies capacity staffing and care model to identify uh, areas for improvement or even to predict uh, challenges uh, recommend uh, enhancement that can we can use um, therefore so the digital twin hospital can be used for generating facility, replica, and intense. This enable uh, resource optimization, risk management. For example, if you model your uh, virtual hospital based on the data of the real hospital, so uh, even with regards to the number of beds and stuff like that. So if you have this sort of data, so you can simulate how the 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 space looks like, and if you add more um um data in the sense that a number of beds and stuff like that so you can simulate how it looks like how you can manage in, in terms of your stuff the efficiency of the space and stuff and stuff like that so that can be uh, made use or improved using this what we call a uh, digital uh, twin for resource optimization even for risk management so what should be avoided and stuff like that so you can predict the scenario if certain things, um, you know, uh, you change variable and stuff like that, what will happen to the space? What will happen to the uh, hospital and stuff like that? Uh, in terms of uh, human body, so uh, we can have this technology to model organ and single cells or individual genetic makeup, uh, physiological characteristics and lifestyle habit to create personal medicine and treatment plans. Uh, so from the data of the real patient and stuff like that, you can replicate the human body, uh, for example, their internal uh, organ or system in order to improve medical care and what sort of treatment that you uh, better to be given to that patient and stuff like that. So you can have a sort of like a personal diagnosis according to the visualization of the data of the organ of the patient and stuff like that. Even you can use it for uh, training uh, uh, planning, uh, planning purposes. Uh, apart from that, um, the technology can also be used to improve the design, development, testing, and monitoring of new drug and medical device. Uh, for example, in terms of drug, I'm sure you are the expert in this area, even the medical devices and stuff like that. So if you were to uh, introduce new drug, for example, or new devices, so you can have this digital uh you know, digital twin to simulate if you want to change the the look or the position or the characteristic of the drug and stuff like that, or even the devices, how it will impact um, uh, the patient or the, the the clients who are using that devices or the uh, patient who are going to take the drug. So this is some things that um, what we have seen has been um, uh, applied or implemented out there. Um, however, in terms of the challenges of uh, mirror world, or some of you can call it a digital twin, so there has been sort of a limited adoption in terms of this technology um, because of the uh, the cost involved as well as the expert that need to be involved in making that simulation uh, and then based on the data, real data and so on uh, might take some time and uh, costly or even um, for a certain reason it can uh, be sorry 
it can be associated with what are called data quality. So, um, for example, how you want to make sure that the data that you receive, um, you know, pertains to the um, biomedical data is data that is accurate as possible and really represent the uh, the patient, for example, because maybe uh, due to the um, um, logistic purposes or any other human errors and stuff like that, that data might not actually uh, the clean and accurate as possible uh, as what the, the real data from that patient. Therefore, when you call... Uh, develop or visualize the model, it doesn't really represent the real data. Uh, another thing is the issue or challenge with regards to data privacy. So, so ye, in this case, um, uh, the technology actually requires um, more and more individual level data by healthcare organization and insurance companies. So, um, over time, this health organization grabs a detailed portrait of bio biology, biological genetic uh, physical and lifestyle related to a particular person. So um, that co sort of uh, personalized data uh, might be in use benefiting the company interest instead of the individual. So uh, this is some things that we need to look into as well, data privacy of the, our uh, patient and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of uh, technology pertaining to AR, uh, so basically these are the things that we need to uh, determine and calibrate, for example, in terms of the camera calibration to show, to measure the, uh, the position, uh, the spatial position of the camera with regards to the uh, physical object or virtual objects. So these are some things that are quite technical, so I'm not going into detail. Uh, apart from that is patient registration. So um, this is something uh, pertaining to patient data for pre-operative planning is 3D volume take data taken from uh, computed tomography, CT or uh, MRI. Um, so this is the purpose where you want to get the view of the internal anatomy and target points of, uh, for the surgeon. So patient data should be registered with respect to a patient to of, real, of the real world coordinate which is called patient registration. And last but not least is in terms of object tracking where you want to uh, determine the position of the camera or marker and also the uh, equipments or instruments being uh, to be used by the uh, surgeon and store all in order to make sure that um, when you use the AR, it will provide a smooth um, um, interaction between the virtual object and uh, and also the uh, real or physical world. Like for example, um, how you want to collaborate with the surgeons, for example, to do some sort of operation. So those who are uh, at the remote areas can instruct and where to a particular point that you need to focus on and stuff like that. So these are the technical things or technology that we need to um, bear in mind when we conduct uh, AR, particularly for uh, medicine. Okay, so um, basically AR in medicine can be uh, divided into uh, three categories. Uh, one what called augmented surgery, uh, and then uh, augmented diagnosis and also augmented practice for training purposes. So um, basically there are many applications uh, either new or has been in the market for some time that I will suggest um, uh, audience to look into. So basically uh, this is just a couple that we have identified that I think is very relevant in our context in particularly for FYM to explore and perhaps can uh, start with a uh, in priority projects to uh, do such things. So um, this is one. So, EcoPixel, so just example of AR using medicine. I hope the internet connection is, is fine. At least we can view one or two. Maybe we try.
Sorry, I'm trying to control my position because this hollow lens here. <laughs> Need to be careful. There's uh, things. So this is a uh, echo pixel introduction where they can uh, visualize the 3D structures of uh, 3D hearts and then do some sort of uh, manipulations, uh, annotation and also do some sort of uh, calibration I suppose, something like that. So I'll skip through. AccuVein is the leading vein viewing system and the standard of care in facilities around the world. It has been shown to improve burst stick success and catheter so this one is some while sort reducing of, uh, patient pain to and to overlay the, the vein or something like that. AccuVein displays a map of the vasculature so it would be, on the skin surface, for, uh, allowing uh, the nurses to verify or something like that. vein patency and avoid to valves jab. and bifurcations. Faster and more successful venous access with less pain leads to higher patient satisfaction. Making it clear why customers rely on AccuVein throughout their facilities. Okay, uh, put another one. Oh, sorry. So this is the one that I just uh, mentioned just now. So those are uh, the active surgeon at the operation theaters and the remote guy or other collaborator from other uh, remotely can actually uh, instruct, um, you know, where to cut or something like that. So this is something that um, we associate with the use of AR. Okay. So this is the guy who uh, collaborate and then instruct uh, the doctors to uh, explain further about the operation or something like that. Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, another one is live logging. This is another categories of uh, metaverse where we define it as a, a process where you record personal life, uh, including daily experiences uh, with wearable sensors like uh, accelerometers, cameras, and others. So it's actually to record, um, for example, data recorded at specific moment using video cameras, provide different analysis of daily activity. Means that, for example, you act going, it, it can tell you about your lifestyle, where you go, what you eat, and something like that, or what what you have done. So. When we have this uh, log of uh, record in real uh, time, so when we want to uh, recap what has been done throughout the days or something like for a certain duration of time or week. So this is some things that help doctors or uh, practitioners to deduce uh, knowledge regarding uh, their behaviors, uh, their patient behaviors. So um, so this is also can some things uh, be uh, used to protect against diseases linked uh, to unhealthy lifestyles such as obesity, uh, depression, and so on. 
So live blogging itself can be divided into well-being, mental health, uh, amnesia, and dementia. Okay. So in this case, for example, what we have identified, um, a sense camp, is where uh, it helps uh, to, you know, um, keep track. For example, this guy might have dementia. So it can uh, capture images where he has been, for example. So in that sense, actually, it, when you gather the data, uh, sorry, uh, the fake photo and stuff like that, it can trigger this guy or patient or person about whether he has done certain things or whether he has taken lunch or something like that, or where he has gone and something like that. So it helps uh, him uh, to uh, recap or trigger him to know whether he has uh, missed it or not, missed their, his lunch or not, something like that. Uh, the things that pertaining to live logging that I think some of you might have used, uh, like for example, Fitbit, to for example, in terms of main, uh, monitoring your well-being, for example, number of steps, something like that. So that is also something that we can keep track and associate that with live logging. So from the data, it actually can help uh, and measure our performance and stuff. All right, uh, secondly, uh, that is about AR. In terms of VR or virtual reality and medicine, basically, uh, I think uh, you also have come across where it has been used in patient education for communication purposes, uh, medical trainings, uh, pain management, and physical therapy, and so on. Okay, so uh, basically, virtual reality, basically, it has the ability to transport your inside and around the human body in order to access and view areas that would traditionally be impossible to reach. For example, you can explore in terms of the internal organs and stuff like that. So it helps you to understand some things uh, in more details, whereas in phys physically is a, a challenge to do so. So uh, this is a, a virtual reality and uh, mental health and uh, junctive therapy. Um, okay. Okay, for example, in this case, uh, the in-situ coaching that's uh, effective for many, dis uh, many disorders can now be delivered in consulting room with the simulation and exposure control as necessary. For example, how you want to train the soldiers, how you want to rehabilitate the soldier from, you know, return from the war and something like that. So this sort of simulation of virtual reality, so uh, help us to come back or to treat them in order to make sure that they how they uh, how they react to such environment and what actually from their the observation of their reactions and what they have thought and something like that can uh, we can communicate those kind of information to the uh, to the doctors or uh, caregivers and something like that in order to treat and to respond accordingly to what their behavior that you have seen um, this one is another thing quite uh, interesting uh, where we found that uh, it has been used in pain management and physical therapy. So it's, in other words, it's helped us to divert the patient's uh, 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 focus towards certain virtual environments instead of focusing on the pain or the rehabilitation process that being undergo by this person. So it's also something that can, uh, what we call it, alleviate the process. If let's say without this some sort of distraction by VR, maybe um, this guy or the patient a bit reluctant to undergo that rehabilitation process due to the, the pain or something like that they have to come across. So this is something that uh, interesting that we have come across. So those are the things that when we associate metaverse in medicines. So the last one uh, I'm going to share about metaverse in medical educations. So with this... Um, Okay, so uh, in this uh, medical education, uh, so we can see that it can uh, be used to develop technical competency for training purposes. Uh, I think later you are going to experience your whole lens. It's something that uh, through this sort of uh, technologies and devices, so uh, you can do some sort of simulation, you can do some sort of training to familiarize with their um, let's say for the you know, virtual organs, stuff like that, or how to treat the patient. So this is something that has been used for medical or training purposes. Um, so for um, 
training or education purposes. So for medical student, um, the experience, um, the the important of AR is that the medical student experiences and learning outcomes that are enhanced by AR means that with the use of AR, actually they can improve their understanding or a certain concept or even uh, familiarize them with a concept uh, practically, uh, not just theoretically. So this is something that can better improve their understanding improve their social skills, how to interact with their patients, and also practical skills if they were to go in the real world. So, um, for example, in this case, it's uh, AR used for, uh, what we call that, uh, improved knowledge and understanding. Uh, there's an app they call Holo Human, which shows a virtual cadaver kind of place of, uh, on a real examination table. So, um, as you can see that the moderator shown is able to interact with the model and user interface through the use of HoloLens headset. So basically, when you put on your headset, actually you can uh, visualize the um, virtual human uh, there. And then you also can interact. Maybe there's a, some sort of questions, training that you need, uh, competency that you need to undergo. So there are buttons to interact with and to see and test whether you have uh, understanding on what it is, uh, what to do, and so on. So this is some things that um, you, I mean, audience can explore uh, later. Uh, another one is uh, what we call the augmented reality use uh, for practical skills. So for example, in this uh, ocular AR sims, the program is to help the optometry students um, using the device. So to explore the structures of the eye, for example, the layer and something like that. So with the use of their, uh, what we call the, the apps and also smartphone that they have uh, at their own place. Uh, okay, so this is another uh, uh, advantage of AR for improving social skill. For example, in this case, when you put on your uh, headset, for example, you can uh, visualize, you know, how this patient, um, you know, to treat this patient in terms of how what he or she is going to talk about, uh, how you observe their his or her reaction and stuff like that. So student can view the patient and interact with the the test result panel and real time vital sign through the use of the Microsoft Hololens too. Um, so in this context or example, the patients. Uh, describes a chest pain associated with uh, my myocardial cardial infarctions. Uh, so this is something that the student can uh, sort of um, have the virtual patient and then uh, see and observe uh, using this uh, what we call that system and also device. And even they can interact with each other. You know, for example, the other uh, students so observing the same. Um, virtual world so um, they can interact and talk uh, to each other and see uh, what's the problems and uh, what you know recommendations stuff like that I think that's the thing that you are the expert in the area so it's just to show the technology that uh, feasible for that context okay uh, last uh, but not least um, in terms of medical uh, metaverse in medical education analysis so I just try to go through uh, quickly the advantages, limitation, challenges, and recommendations. So, um, so in terms of the advantages, so there are many advantages. So these are the sum of the uh, advantage why we use Metaverse for medical education. First, for, uh, in terms of in accessible environments, so some sort of environment that uh, limited, you know, has limited access and stuff like that. So you from your own place, for example, for imagine that, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, era, so you can access to the environments and still experience the learning process, uh, education process remotely. And then it also can improve your, uh, the empathy training. So because of the virtual, which rea uh, simulate the real environment, so you can have the sort of, uh, uh, virtual world that mimic the real environment. Therefore, when you have this sort of training, actually it implies or describe or visualize the things that you are going to explain in the real world. Uh, although you do it remotely or uh, what we call distant learning. And it's uh, 
I must say that the technology can be used to support traditional link. It's not to what we call that to take over, rather to improve and enhance the learning experience, particularly when we talk about the learning, uh, remote learning and stuff like that. Uh, it also can increase participation in class because you have something to visualize, something to interact with. Therefore, we can see that the huge, uh, uh, what we call that, um, engaging uh, participation among the student and also the instructor or the lecturers. So it's a better learnings and can increase student motivation and last but not least, it can help us in improving the cognitive and skill mastery. So, uh, however, there are some limitations uh, with regard to metaverse in medical education. Uh, one is distant learning landscape uh, and then cognitive load because you um, put on your headset or something like that. So there's lots of information that you need to digest. So it might cause you what we call cognitive load, what to recall, what to see, and maybe you are so immersed into that. So this is something that we need to look into. Time constraint, uh, accessibility, affordability in terms of the equipment, devices, and I think lack of educational content, maybe there are technology, but lack of educational content, relevant content that can be used to uh, train the students. Uh, sometimes it's uh, what we call the difficulty in assessing the learning uh, process or environment. And then there's uh, medical related after effect. For example, uh, when you put, uh, maybe expert can share, if you put for some time, let's say one hour and stuff like that, that might have uh, the what we call that the cyber sickness or something like that uh, so you cannot uh, uh, you are trying to what we call that uh, from the virtual world now you are into the real world so there's a transition or gap to adapt from you know for example I give example for but for example if you play so long in the game or something like ever plus with the immersive environment so is some sort of uh, medical effects that you might experience after using it for uh, some time. Okay, um, last uh, but not least, um, these are the virtual reality challenges in medical education and treatment. So basically we can divide it into two categories. One, uh, we define it as general challenges and secondly, the specific challenges. So for the general challenges, uh, it might reduce face-to-face -face communication since it's a virtual world, you can have it remotely, therefore uh, you miss the more face-to-face -face real communications like real world. Um, and then in terms of uh, the cost and, and also the user attitudes toward the technology uh, in terms of the lecturers or the students and stuff like that. And for the specific challenges uh, can be categorized or classified into uh, in terms of the process to design uh, the contents. Um, so it will be a bit challenged to identify and recommend what will be the most effective contents to be represented to the uh, users in this context. Uh, uh, lecturers, surgeons, students. And you need to get involved with a lot of what we call user-centered design in order to make sure that what the contents to be delivered is actually according to the user requirements and what they perceive important to them rather than what you believe important to the designer itself or himself. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, safety consideration. So uh, we are treatment based on the expert opinion, uh, you need to have uh, what we call that challenges in terms of creating safety parameters. Uh, the side effect that I mentioned just now, common side effects, uh, addiction to VR-based technology. Some might be might be addicted to use VR, like playing games, something like that. So it might uh, give some sort of challenge. Um, and last but not least, uh, evaluation and validation of VR application. So this is something that uh, quite important particularly in my areas, to determine the usability of the applications, whether it really improves their understanding, knowledge, and experience, or uh, does, it, um, it, does it require um, some sort of a redesign uh, in terms of the contents, in terms of the features, and in order to make sure that the experience is at the maximum. 
So these are the uh, evaluation and validation process that we need to take rigorously in order to determine, particularly for the medical student, it's a very important um, um, areas that we need to have accurate application and stuff like that in order to make sure that they have they are going to experience or undergo the training that mimic as the real world. So for the other areas, uh, education, perhaps the accuracy might not be that important in terms of visualizing the organ internals and how to respond or to recommend or to give treatment, um, not that important. Okay. Uh, so um, here we have... Uh, suggested some recommendation of VR application if we were to use it in medical uh, education and treatment. Um, so uh, it actually can uh, what we call reduce face-to-face -face communication. So um, in this context, evaluation should be made in real settings. Uh, we need to have more attractive design, uh, attractive contents, um, particularly for medical education. And then uh, we need to have a very... Um, high quality immersions level and uh, feeling of presence um, and then education so as I mentioned it can improve uh, in terms of the uh, compre produce more comprehensive manuals where we can have uh, determine how where and for whom uh, the technology is developed for um, another thing is the user centered design is the process that we need to take care like in medical uh, Perspective. For example, we need to get involved with the um, uh, intensity. You need to improve our engagement with the uh, target user. For example, surgeons, uh, students, stuff like that, in order to really understand what their problems and what their needs. And then before we design the attractive contents at the end to be used by them. Um, so those are the recommendations that we uh, suggested here. Okay, so these are other things that um, I would like to uh, share as well. So I guess um, I'm running out of time because I need to get to a uh, second presenter. So I'm. Uh, this is uh, what we have identified so far within such a uh, one on one or something like that. So I hope that uh, in the future we can have uh, collaborations, join uh, research projects either uh, at university level or international level and I believe that there's a good and uh, opportunity that we uh, embark on this um, uh, metaverse in medical education training. So by then I wrap up my um, uh, presentation and thank you very much for listening. Assalamualaikum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Prof Amiro for the insights. Well, point taken about the pros and cons. I think there are a lot of keywords that he shared with us. Does uh, anyone have any question at the end? Uh? Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Prof Amir. Okay, so let's move on to the second talk of the session. Next, we will have... Uh, Mr. Daniel Andrew and the team to share about the applications of HoloLens and the mixed reality in healthcare. Just a quick introduction about Daniel. Daniel Andrew is the co-founder and CEO of Hologram Indonesia. He spent the last nine years together with his team in Hologram Indonesia exploring everything there is to know about immersive technology, especially AR and MR technology. Okay, the team has implemented the AR and MR-based solution for different kind of industry in Indonesia since 2014. And they believe for the next five years, the adoption of AR and MR technology for empowering business operations will grow even further. Okay, with that, I think, let us welcome Daniel.
Sound is coming, right? Check, check. Yeah, check. I think it's okay. Whatever. Okay, so first, I would like to congratulate to all of us here because at the moment that you step in here, this is the moment that you welcome to the future. And uh, before we start, I would like to st uh, reminiscing back, I think for the past 30 years that digital revolutions already brought us many things, countless of breakthrough in the field of hardware and the software uh, really gave a differentiation in our life. But I think uh, we are agree there are two uh, main breakthrough, I think I can call it, uh, the internet revolutions and the smartphone revolutions. With the internet revolutions, we can uh, get connected to each other, no matter where we are. And of course, the smartphone revolutions brings the, uh, I could say, the game changer in our life, because I believe that each of us now have their own smartphone in their pocket, right? And also connected to the internet. And these smartphone things, I think, becomes our daily habit. We put everything, uh, what uh, our schedule and everything inside our smartphone. But have you ever realized that? Uh, is there any uh, what what could be the next big thing? Because I think uh, since the last thirty years, we are still progressing inside the smartphone. No more. So. I'd like to uh, make us remember that I believe that most of us already seen this movie before, right? The Iron Man movie. And one of the iconic scene that I remember is the when Tony Stark uh, built his armor with the help of the holographic technology. And this scene alone actually give us a big hint about what could be the next big thing. What could happen in our life that will change our daily activity that could enhance our performance for the productivity. And for me, uh, the era is called mixed reality era. So uh, the Iron Man, Iron Man movie uh, first released in 2008. And eight years later, uh, Microsoft launched the first Microsoft HoloLens uh, in 2016. So uh, maybe a little story about the first generation of the HoloLens. Uh, actually, at the time, we purchased the first HoloLens because we are eager to experience the HoloLens uh, about how people can use HoloLens in everyday life for the business operation, especially. But unfortunately, at the time, the response of, uh, the market response is not so good, I could say. Uh, I have to say honestly. Because the first thing, uh, the first reason uh, we analyzed that uh, Holo, the first HoloLens is not uh, cannot uh, break through the market is the user experience, because uh, first uh, the point of view of the user uh, is not uh, good enough. Uh, when you wear the the first HoloLens, the point of view of the holographic things only small. You can only see a little bit of uh, uh, hologram object, but you already can interact with the object. And the second thing is there is no urgency in the market to adopt this kind of technology. Because in 2016, you still can do everything offline. You can do a training simulation or uh, there is no need to do a remote maintenance like uh, now. So in 2016, I could say that the adoption of this technology is not so much. And then three years later, Microsoft launched the second generation of the HoloLens. And even in the second generation, Microsoft uh, make a differentiation. They create another version. Uh, the right one is the, it's called Trimble XR10. As you can see, there's a safety helmet embedded on the HoloLens. The usage of the Trimble XR10 is used for the outdoor. Uh, and the left one, usually we, uh, we are using this for the indoor activity. And I could say uh, the second generation of the HoloLens, Microsoft really did a great, great job. Because the first thing, they enhance the user experience of uh, HoloLens user. In the second generation, you can see a more larger, better uh, point of view for the uh, holographic. And then also, in the second generation, uh, Microsoft improved 
how you interact with the virtual object. Because uh, you can think that HoloLens is like your wearable PC. So if you are using your PC or laptop, you are interact with the laptop using mouse, right? Cursor, mouse. So the question is, if you are using HoloLens, how you interact with the object, with the holograph holographic object? The answer is by using your hands. So you do much of air gesture. And for some people, this air gesture actually is troublesome because you need to uh, make yourself get used to it at first. But uh, after you get used to it, no problem. So uh, in the second generation, uh, Microsoft makes, uh, I could say it like a more, more uh, logical way to interact with the virtual object. This is the example of uh, when you are using HoloLens. This is the example how you interact with the virtual object, with the hologram object. So for example, there's a, a piano. You can uh, touch, press the piano using your uh, finger directly. So by default, HoloLens treat your fingers, your hands as a pointer, laser pointer. So you can do lots of uh, interac uh, interaction with the virtual object. Similar, the way you interact with the real world object. For example, I grab this bottle with my hand. If this bottle is hologram, I can do it as well if I'm using the HoloLens. I can grab it like this. These features uh, and lots of uh, another features, of course, uh, to support our, uh, us as developer to create a custom solution uh, to support the business process. And I think before we get any further, I would like to uh, show you the video from Microsoft that uh, explains how the mixed reality can change our daily life. gives our lives meaning. It drives us to seek out others who feel the same way. Okay, why don't you input the data and we'll take a look together. Hey Mari, what you got for me? To find those who share our views, yet offer different perspectives. Saw this net. Here. Challenge us with new ways of seeing. Deepen our understanding. And enrich our lives. Great things happen when we commit to something bigger than ourselves. Let's take a closer look at it. Place this here. Let's see how we go from there, okay? This sense of collaboration and the feelings of connection it brings excites us. Hey, just in time. I'm going to move it slightly, okay? It's yours, take it. We have two planes right now on the same trajectory. As we put people first, technology fades into the background and feels like anything but. Asia, what do you think? I think we had 330, maintaining 2800. We'll be clear for approach. Excellent. This changes the way we see the world and in turn, changes the world we see. These numbers are looking great, actually. There's promise in the possibilities, and what we see and create next will stretch the imagination. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Slowly coming towards the thumb. A world without boundaries. Good job, a lot better than yesterday. Yeah. Excellent, slowly bring A world down. where technology enhances, not limits humanity. with people front, center, and in the spotlight. The future is here, and here can be anywhere. Introducing Microsoft Mesh. As you can see on the video, that uh, how the next big thing, I, I call it the next big thing, uh, how HoloLens could be the next big thing. Because as we are here now, every one of us bring uh, our smartphone every day no matter uh, when the time, right? And then uh, HoloLens could be treated as the next smartphone. But the difference is you wear your smartphone. Or, uh, and during the work time, you can uh, wear HoloLens and, uh, to support your productivity uh, day by day. And I know uh, this video, 
I could say this is so um, so ideal, right? And currently, the time is the early phase that we are trying to adopt to this kind of the new technology. We try to adapt to this kind of uh, new technology. So the best part of this uh, video, actually, the best part of the mixed reality uh, era starting now. So uh, maybe the next question, how's the, uh, the progress of MR and HoloLens uh, so far? Uh, I would like to share uh, our experience uh, uh, that uh, we did in Indonesia. So uh, for the past two years, especially, uh, as we know, during the COVID pandemics, uh, really uh, forced business to try the new technology, to adapt and to adopt uh, the new technology. And one of the technology that uh, during the, the pandemic period, uh, one of the technology that helped them to still support their business is the mixed reality and the HoloLens. Uh, these are uh, our one uh, big names uh, in Indonesia, big company in Indonesia that already implemented uh, mixed reality solution with HoloLens for the past two years. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are uh, across uh, different in industry. Philips, I would like uh, to highlight Philips because Philips uh, is uh, Philips Healthcare, so the same industry as uh, us here. And then also there are one uh, education. Uh, Industry, the Institute Pertanian Bogor for Agriculture in Indonesia, it's a national university as well, and other uh, company. So, uh, what we are doing with this company? So, uh, what we did with these companies, basically, uh, we are implementing two solutions. The first one, we are doing the remote field maintenance, and then the second one, we do a remote training simulation. Why we did the remote field maintenance? Because during the COVID time, there are difficulties to send uh, people around. Uh, you, uh, we must stay at home and work uh, from home. But the needs of doing the maintenance still happen. So in order to cut the cost and as well to cut the traveling time, uh, most of the company want to try to implement the remote uh, field maintenance solution. And I would like to show you the video of the how we implement this uh, remote uh, field maintenance with Philips Healthcare. So, actually, this is one of our first project with the mixed reality and uh, Hololens. Uh, the case is we are helping them. Uh, they are doing the maintenance for the MRI machine, but the problem was the experts cannot be uh, standby on the field. So all the person in the field is the, I could say, the, the new team, the new engineer. They must be guided from the experts, uh, which is uh, stay in uh, abroad in Israel, if I'm not mistaken. So the experts in Israel uh, do a remote access call to the field engineer, and he guided the field engineer uh, like this one. So one of the features that help uh, for the remote maintenance is you can share the file anytime, anywhere. And the person who do a maintenance can see the uh, file shared uh, without need to hold their uh, smartphone. So basically it's hands-free. They can do the, all the maintenance with both hands so it doesn't disturb the uh, working, the maintenance process. And also we can do the live annotation. So the experts in the HQ can uh, point some uh, arrow to give uh, direction what to do to the field engineer and vice versa. This is uh, actually the solution that are working until now. So uh, many, many uh, companies uh, right now try to implement uh, this remote field maintenance because uh, the benefit uh, they are uh, already uh, feel is uh, it's cutting the cost and travel time for the experts to go to the field. But today we are not going deep through about the remote field maintenance. I would like uh, to show you more today about the second scenario for the remote training simulation for today. So uh, for the remote training simulation, we are uh, using the Microsoft platform called Microsoft Guides. 
the Microsoft Guides is the no-code platform uh, for you to be able to create the custom uh, scenario for the training process. So I would like to show you the video of the Microsoft Guides. So the goals of the Microsoft Guides platform is to help the trainee to get a better experience when they are doing the training session. So in this example, uh, the demo is uh, the trainee using the HoloLens. Uh, this one is the trainer. So the trainer first need to adjust the uh, training scenario, what should be done, step-by-step -step process. And then this one is the trainee. She's the one who's using HoloLens and get the experience of the uh, guided holographic simulation. So in this case, uh, they are using the real uh, machine to training. But the difference is the step-by-step -step is shown in the form of holographic, like this one. So the trainee can see what she do, uh, what she do next uh, in the holographic form. And the trainer can configure uh, what's the step-by-step -step process and observe the behavior of the trainee using the real-time data, as this one. So uh, after this, we are going to perform uh, the, de the demo for the Microsoft Guide. So maybe uh, some of you can experience as well uh, on this stage live. OK, before we get into the demo, uh, I'm trying to find the paper about the study, actually, because uh, we are doing the business. We are not doing the, uh, we are, didn't do the research. But I tried to, do, uh, to find the research about how mixed reality could help uh, people, especially for the training. So I get the paper from the, sorry, Kyung uh, Puk, sorry, Kyung Puk National University from Korea. Uh, they are also doing the tests uh, with mixed reality to help uh, people with MCI problem uh, uh, to get rid of the problem using the mixed reality. And I think we are not going through the paper, of course. Uh, I would like to highlight the conclusion. So the conclusion is the MR-based cognitive training system can be used as cognitive training tool to improve visual spatial working memory in individuals with MCI. I would like to highlight the word visual spatial. So uh, the meaning of visual spatial is uh, relating to ordinating the visual perception of the spatial relationship of objects. And visual spatial construction is a central cognitive ability. So uh, what I get from this one with the uh, continuous simulation using the holographic uh, simulation using Microsoft Guides, we can do lots of uh, simulation with no cost because we can perform a full holographic simulation uh, anytime, anywhere. And the experience of the full holographic simulation is almost similar as you do like uh, with the real things. So I think uh, now I would like to go into the demo session. So all of us here can see what is uh, the experience, how's the experience of uh, the HoloLens user when using the uh, HoloLens. And we already prepared some demo, a uh, little bit of demo about the training process of surgical, uh, of appendix surgical. So this uh, gonna be a little uh, role play. Mr. Kevin here will help me uh, he will act as lecturer, and I will act as a student. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as you can see on the screen, I would like to explain a little bit about this HoloLens device first. So what I'm wearing now is HoloLens 2. Ah, you see here, there's a alert that uh, asks me to adjust my uh, HoloLens for my eyes because HoloLens track your uh, retina. So every uh, 
each time you uh, transfer HoloLens to other person, actually you need to readjust the uh, focus first. But uh, for me, it's okay. I will do the cancel. And as you can see on the screen, this is the field of view. This is what I see with the HoloLens. The middle camera is used to record uh, the environment. The left and right camera is used to map uh, the object or the planes around us. So basically, uh, when we are uh, using the HoloLens at the first time, HoloLens will do a spatial mapping around us. So uh, it can differentiate between table and a floor and even object. That's uh, one of the features from the HoloLens. And as I mentioned before about the how do we interact with the HoloLens, we are using our hands. So as uh, you can see uh, on the screen, see when I open my uh, palm, there is a holographic menu here because it detects my hand as a pointer and it triggers to open the menu. So this is the user interface of the HoloLens. So usually if you are uh, using your PC, this one is the page when you click on the windows on the left side and there are uh, application on there. This one is the same, the concept is the same. This is the window when you can choose your apps. And for today's uh, session, we already prepared a demo using the Microsoft Guides here. Uh, we already prepared, uh, we already opened actually the Microsoft Guides. So I'm gonna close it. Hey, wait, okay. Okay. So uh, this is the user interface of the Microsoft Guides. So first thing, you go uh, press this one. Ah, as you can see, this is the uh, floating user interface. And we already uh, prepared the demo, appendectomy. There are actually uh, two modes for the outdoor and the operate mode. Outdoor is used when the first time, uh, as a trainer, you need to set up the holographic, uh, where should it play, uh, be placed, the size and things. We already did that before, so we, we are going to right through to the operate mode. Ah. First, uh, I still need to place the position of the hologram. I think Mr. Kevin before already set it up, set it up right? Thank you. So uh, we can go uh, proceed to the next step. As you can see, my hand here, there is a laser pointer, right? This laser pointer is used to interact with the object. I can do a pinch interaction with this one and move. Like this one. So if, you, if I want to do a confirmation, I just uh, direct my hands to this confirm button and pinch. Okay. Now, as you can see, here's the hologram anatomy of human body. I can maybe a little bit go down. Okay, so uh, the goals of this demo is uh, we would like to ask the student to do uh, steps about uh, appendix surgical. And as you can see, uh, this is the card, the info card. Oops, sorry. This is the info card. Uh, you can use the info card to give instruction to the student. What should uh, they do next? So I just need to uh, press next arrow. So uh, we get into the second step. Ah. On the second step, we are asking student to analyze uh, what kind of disease based on, on the symptoms that Mr. John Doe had. Uh, I think based on the symptoms, Mr. Jondo might have appendicitis. I can choose appendicitis. Okay, now the students, uh, me as a student, uh, already got into the operation room. I Actually, I can uh, explore 360 so I can see clearly what the holographic model does. And for the first step, we need to uh, put the cannula insert into the abdomen. And 
what is great about this max reality i can see clearly where the position should i put the uh, equipment and then next i can get into the next step okay for the step number four we need the insufflation process by putting the co2 to abdomen to create some workspace actually i would like to apologize first if there is any mistaken term because i'm not a medical expert here but we are trying our best to uh, do a demo in surgical process for the appendix so this is the animation uh, for the in insufflation process and the next step after the insufflation process done we need to uh, place the trockers on this spot as you can see we can see clearly where should I put the trockers and there's also explanation what is trockers and things and then finally for the next step after all the trockers placed uh, on the spot and then we can uh, do a surgical process and also we can put the video here So uh, this video show about the what happened inside the abdomen while this animation still working uh, and uh, for example I'm doing the surgical. And done. I'm just finished my six step uh, simple process about the surgical process. So with this kind of simulation uh, which you can do anywhere everywhere basically this could help uh, the students to perform uh, day day by day uh, simulation by using hololens and with to actually with no cost because you don't need to uh, prepare the operation room and things you can do it uh, in full holographic simulation uh, mr kevin can you uh, oh sorry it's from my side okay i think uh i would like to invite uh the guests here maybe any one of you want to try this uh live on stage anyone maybe we still have time five more minutes i think any one of you want to try oh prof please come to the stage okay thank you prof wait i will help you to setting this up from the start okay prof can you stand here please yeah so uh sorry prof i would like to put it yeah it's okay you can wear your glass ah this is one of the benefits of uh, mixed reality device if you are using the virtual reality device such as oculus you cannot wear the glasses but for the HoloLens, it's safe for the glass user. Okay, Prof, uh, can you see the virtual object here, right? Yeah. The, the human body? Human body yeah. The yeah. Okay, the window. And there's a window uh, ask you to adjust, right? No, the, uh, please uh, press the cancel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So maybe for the first time, you need to uh, have uh, adjustment. So just put your hand here. Yes. Uh, maybe you, uh, you can uh, put, uh, step back a little bit. Okay. Can you uh, use your right hand to uh, pointing the card? Yes. Sorry. Uh, sorry, no. Uh, please press no. Press it. Yes, uh, maybe you can step a uh, little to the right. Okay, uh, Prof, can you direct your hand to don't don't don, uh, direct your head to the uh, cross, but more to uh, maybe step a little bit to the right. Yes, uh, hold your hand. Yes, pinch. And move to the right. Okay, great. You can see clearly the instruction, right? And you can uh, direct your head to the arrow 
the right arrow to proceed to the next step. Just, you need to, uh, yes, your, your head. Okay, hold it. Okay. There's also a second interaction with, uh, you don't need to uh, pinch, uh, do a pinch or touch. You just need to direct your head to the uh, arrow and things. And as you can see on the left, Prof, uh, there's a human anatomy. Maybe you can take a little downstairs to observe. Be careful, Prof, this is stairs. <laughs> Actually, you can a uh, bit uh, stare down. Yeah, go down. So the information is right, Prof. Okay, thank God. Okay, uh, you can proceed as well to the next step. Uh, try to find the card. Yeah. Uh, based on the symptoms, uh, you need to choose uh, which symptoms might be. The, yes, this one. Just read, uh, okay. Uh, yes. Okay, great. Now you can see to the left, Prof. This is the operation table. You can walk around, actually, yeah, to see the patient. I would like to ask, what do you think, Prof, about this one? You can move around and the object's still there. So it won't uh, move according to your place, but it will stuck in uh, this place. This is called the spatial anchor. Yeah. For this one, we said it, uh, you cannot yeah, uh, manipulate the object. But uh, as you can uh, see on the previous video, we can use the real object and do a manipulation on the object. That's the second scenario. But yeah, for this one, we said it, uh, there, there, nothing happened if you touch with this one. But we can set it, uh, if you touch something, you can do uh, animation or things based on the scenario. Okay, next, mungkin, uh, Prof bisa. Okay, go to right arrow again. Just direct your, yeah, okay, great. So the next step is about the insufflation process, I think. You can uh, direct your head down again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is the full holographic simulation mode. So uh, all the things we are doing, uh, we are uh, do a 3D modeling for the hologram. Okay. You can proceed to the next step as well. You can direct your head, yeah, to the right arrow. Yeah, just hold it. Okay, great. This is also the next step for the trocar's placement. You can see the uh, object again on your left side. Yeah. And you can proceed to the final step. And in the final step, there is a video, actually, Prof, you can a little bit step back, but uh, careful. There's a stairs. Yeah. Ah, there's a video. You can uh, direct your head to the play button. Yes, just hold your head like that. Yeah. And the uh, video will play along the animation process of the surg uh, surgery. Yes, and the uh, appendix has been removed. Okay, proceed to the last step. You can direct your head to the right arrow. Done, success. Please applause for Prof. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, uh, let me help you.
Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's uh, about the HoloLens and the, how mixed reality can change the future of the training simulation. Actually, our goals is not to replace the training process, but to enhance the current training process with the holographic simulation. So you can do a lot of better scenario with uh, less cost and anytime and anywhere. That's from me. Uh, thank you. Maybe uh, there's a question uh, next to the question, maybe. Uh, anyone has any question? Or you want to try? <laughs> Afterwards, you can come out and try. Yes, I'd like to invite you to our booth, uh, maybe, if there's a further question and want to try. Yes, so the question, I think we have from... Question? Okay, I, I would like to ask, when you developed the hologram for the appendicitis, how difficult was it to develop that? Or do you have a software that can allow the doctors to actually uh, develop those, whatever training they want to do for their training? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, to answer that question, uh, actually, uh, for this demo, uh, we developed based on... Uh, video that already exists. But if the case, there's no, uh, maybe no video exists or the, no step-by-step -step exists, we need to uh, do, uh, what is it called? The, uh, we are doing uh, the interview with the doctors. How the step-by-step -step process, what could be, what should be displayed on the hologram and do all the uh, details first. And then we create the 3D models and then we put on the Microsoft Guide platform and we set the step-by-step -step process. Mm -hmm. That's how we develop uh, this demo. So we need to, of course, interact with the doctors about everything, the details that we need to put on the hologram. That's uh, right. usually the way we do uh, our solution. Can, can the doctors do it, create this without programmers? Uh, actually, the doctors... Without programmers can, can, but they need the help support from the 3D modeler. Oh, so okay. uh, 3D modeler, the, the, the job for 3D modeler uh, is to do a modeling and the animation about the process and the anatomy and uh, anything else. And then after the doctors have the 3D resource, actually the doctors can put it uh, by himself to the platform because the platform is no code platform. You don't need a programmer to create the scenarios. You just need to do drag and drop as long as you have the 3D assets. That's it. So it yeah. seems like probably you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the support of the 3D modeling. Yeah, because just now the video was showing the yeah. teachers do it themselves. Yes, that's correct. Awesome. Yeah, correct. So possible. Actually, that's the goal. So you can do it yourself. Yeah. Any other question? Hi, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. I just, just would like to ask, uh, we, in terms of uh, utilization of smartphone, we need like many years for people, like 90% of people to hold even a smartphone, right? So yeah. how, how do you en like envisage this, this technology? How long <laughs> will it take until it becomes mainstream? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, actually, this uh, at the moment, we are still in early phase, maybe if we are, uh, I, I would like to analogy to a smartphone. Currently is the time where we first know Apple, Apple smartphone, uh, when the first Steve Jobs uh, launched about the Apple. This is the time. This is the time where all of us uh, see and experience the device itself, and we need to uh, adapt uh, to the interaction. Uh, if you ask maybe around five years, for the next five years, this technology will be common and also the price will be lower and lower. So uh, most of the user can uh, use this uh, HoloLens things. So hopefully in the next five until 10 years, this become our daily basis so we can support our, uh, enhance our productivity. That's my answer. Five years. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. 
Any other question, maybe? Hi, Mr. Daniel. Yeah. Um, do you know which hospital that using this Hello Lens at the uh, moment? Currently, for the hospital in Indonesia, uh, we are still not implementing for the hospital actually. Why? Because uh, for the hospital, for hospital especially for the surgical process and things, it's quite risky. We would like to start it from the education first. Why? Because the education is less risky, but the content of the education is still same for the healthcare, right? The purpose is still the same. And the first thing that we can do with the education is start by, uh, by doing the training simulation using the holographic simulation. That's what we are uh, plan to do for the next, I think for the next year. Because uh, in Indonesia itself, uh, there are some uh, demands uh, of the holographic training process, especially for the surgical process. And we are doing this right now. And also that would be the great start for the healthcare industry. Yeah, you're welcome. What about in the West, US? US, uh, as far as I know, last year or this year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Microsoft conduct the live surgeon, uh, surgical with the HoloLens and the remote, remote assist, I think. So they, uh, the doctors in the different area doing the remote guided uh, surgical process live. So it's already started the about the, this mixed things, but still the same. We are still on the early phase. We are still trying to adapt, try to readjust what should we do with this mixed reality and our daily uh, operation. What should uh, we try to start it first? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. My yeah. name is uh, Yu Kong. Uh, so I think from medicine, we're also quite curious uh, and interested when new things are introduced, whether there are any record of side effects or groups ah, of yeah. people that can't use the mixed reality, yeah. any, any info on that? Yes, uh, actually the difference between mixed reality in, and virtual reality is uh, quite far. Uh, if I talk about the virtual reality, uh, the goals of virtual reality, we go into the virtual world. So our environment is virtual. But for mixed reality, the virtual object comes to the real world, but the environment is still our uh, own world, real world. And the problem with the dizziness usually comes uh, with the VR device. Because with the VR device, you go into the fully virtual world. And sometimes, uh, uh, for myself, I get motion sickness, actually. If I uh, use uh, device VR uh, too long, I get motion sickness. Because uh, if you start, uh, because VR have a joystick, right? You can control the joystick, uh, move around, but your body still stands still. That's cause the motion sickness. So, uh, but in mixed reality, it's different. If you want to move around, you just need to walk. So uh, the virtual object will stay there uh, and that will uh, no, uh, cause no motion sickness or dizziness as far as we try to the user. And it's more uh, friendly to the glass user. Yeah. Okay. What about in terms of development cost, VR programs, MR program. Actually, it's the same. same. The, the, the basic development of the VR and mixed reality is the same. But the different only the device uh, that we launched the apps on. Okay. Yeah. Because myself, I have been in e-learning. Yeah. Trying to go into VR, AR. It seems like now I have to skip VR then. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you feel so? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you're not into VR then? Oh, yeah, okay. I, I, I couldn't say that I'm not into, <laughs> but uh, there are more restrictions in VR. And that. we are heavily, uh, yeah, we need the device in order to experience full experience about the immersive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And motion sickness is the main okay. problem for me, actually. So far, HoloLens, no motion sickness. Yes, because uh, if you want to move, just move your body. Okay. It's the same as you wear the glasses. All you need to do is uh, to adapt to the interaction with the air gesture, with the user interface, with your hands. That's okay. what you need to do with the mixed reality and HoloLens. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any more questions from the crowd or online? No. Okay. If if not, I think yeah. let's thank Daniel by giving him a thank round you. of applause. Okay. Thanks again, Daniel, for the sharing. So I think I think we are much over time, over short. Uh, we just uh, maybe would like to end the session maybe by photo. Is it okay?
Everyone or just speakers? Speakers, everyone? Okay. Uh, can, can the speakers come up here? Let's take a picture. So that concludes the session today. Thanks again everyone for coming. If you would like to try on the HoloLens, feel free to come down here. Okay? We'll see you uh see you guys again. Have a good day. <laughs>